can't get my glasses on with all of this stuff. Oh my days. Yeah, I'm doing a live tonight. Um, yeah, working on the intro. Um, hold on, can you hear me? Let me just um, get my stuff up. Get myself ready. Would help if I got ready beforehand. Um, yeah, so this today is the first lesson of the chemistry A level. <laughs> Yay. How's it going, Gabby? Okay, yeah, so this is the first I'm gonna do the whole course of chemistry, but it's um this is the first lesson. I'm trying to sort myself out. My other mic broke, so I've got a bit of a dodgy mic here. Um yeah. How's it going, Gabby? You good? Um okay. So chemistry, basically today, the first five, to, it's about a one hour lesson, maybe less than that. <laughs> I say that, it always goes on longer. Um, this, there's some maths to do because with atomic structure, with time of flight spectrometry, and we're basically just very quickly recapping the atomic structure. And you might say, this can't be A-level. You're more than likely not to get a question on this, but you have to know it. It's like the first lesson is like a recap on atomic structure, but that's going to take five minutes. And then we'll go into um, looking at mass spectrometry and the, the more a level -y stuff. Okay, so very quick recap. Can you tell me what A, B and C are on the diagram? My God, I should get my glasses. Um, I think two years ago, I didn't need glasses. I've been staring at screens so much now, and now I'm probably going to have like triple thick ones. Um, so A, B, C, anybody know what those particles are? Yeah, so we've got an electron. Yeah, nice one. Nice, nice. Nice R, Q, and R. And Lois. What about B and C? <sighs> yeah, C's the neutron. Good, and B's the proton. So obviously... You can tell that because there's three protons, three electrons. Groovy. Right. What about D and E? So if you were studying physics, you'd call E the proton number and D the nucleon number. But as it's chemistry, we call D mass number and E is the atomic number. Okay. And then just a quick recap. I know you guys, this is dead easy peasy for you guys, but relative mass is one, one. And depending on what exam board you do, basically, it's a negligible amount. One over 2,000 for the electron. Now, we can't actually weigh protons. That's right. We can't weigh protons or neutrons um, or electrons. They're too light. But what we're saying here is that 2,000 electrons would be the same mass as a neutron or a proton. And actually, a neutron is simply a proton with an electron added. So a proton is slightly heavier, but it's so negligible, there's no point. We just say they're the same. And yeah, you're right. The relative charge plus zero and the electron is minus. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. What do we call atoms that have lost or gained electrons? Thank you, R, Q, N, R. That is right. Ions. So all dead easy peasy. Um, that is your basic atomic structure. Uh, but also, you remember all of that from GCSE. So well done, guys. Um, couple more things. What do we call these types of atoms? Oh, my screen's in the way of some of this. Let me, uh, my camera. Anyone remember the name of these types of atoms? Got nitrogen 14, 15, and 16. That's right, Gabby. That's right, Lois. Uh, Lois, isotopes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, what would be the difference physically or chemically with these isotopes? So we've got nitrogen 14, 15, and 16. Would they have any differences in their chemical reactivity? Would they have any differences, do you think, in their physical properties? Physical properties are things like melting point, boiling point, solubility, and that. Yeah, they have different neutrons, same protons. Well done. But chemically, 
will they react different? Would nitrogen 14 join with oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide, but nitrogen 15 go, oh, no. Like, is there a difference chemically in how they react? No, well done, Gabby. There's no difference in their reactivity because what's the reason? Why do nitrogen 14, 15 and 16 all react in the same way? What decides the reactivity of an atom or an element? Yeah, same electrons in the outer shell. Nice. Some people call them valence electrons, the electrons in the outer shell. But, um, great. Now, physically, there may be a difference because the mass is different, which means those weak intermolecular forces we talked about at GCSE. You're going to learn about a lot more about those intermolecular forces at A level later on in the bonding topic. But essentially, the larger molecules get, the higher the boiling point. So we might expect a nitrogen molecule made of two nitrogen 16s to have a slightly different boiling point, maybe a slightly higher boiling point than a nitrogen molecule made of two nitrogen 14s. So it will affect their physical properties. Potentially. Or maybe not. Um, we'll find out when we do the forces chapter. OK, this is a bit of a recap um, on the history of the atom. So you might remember which scientists came up with the idea that atoms were like pool balls or snooker balls. Uh, you couldn't divide them. They were just solid spheres. Does anyone remember this person's name back from GCSE? And by the way, this is all on the specification. Uh, plum pudding's the second one, but the first one was the solid balls. Yeah, it was a dude called Dalton. I think it was James Dalton in 18... 94, 93, I don't know. Anyway, it was a long time ago, um, the end of the 19th century. Um, which scientist discovered the electron um, just a few years later and so disproved the indivisible model above? This was the plum pudding person. So, well done. Uh, ah, James Chadwick came later. Uh, Lois, he discovered the neutron later on. This is actually the dude who came up with the plum pudding. Um, JJ uh, Thompson. Yeah, that's right. Thomas something. It's Thompson, JJ Thompson. There's supposed to be some dots and stuff. Okay, so he actually discovered the electron. So we always cuss the plum pudding model and be like, nah, it's wrong. But actually, this dude discovered the electron and disproved the theory that it's a solid ball. He said, no, there's things inside there. It's not like just a solid ball. And both of those theories were good theories. They enabled scientists to make predictions. So each theory is building on the others. Of course, the plum pudding is that it's a sphere of positive charge with electrons studded within. Who disproved the plum pudding, guys? And again... We know what I'm doing here. Absolutely. Um, who said Rutherford? Gabby did and RQNR did. Well done, guys. That's right. Ernest Rutherford. And he had two scientists called Geiger and Marsden working for him. I've got a dodgy neck at the moment, so I'm moving like a robot. So, oh, my neck. I don't know. I slept wrong last night. Um, so... Just in case you're thinking, why is this weirdo moving like this? E That's my neck. So, yeah, Ernest Rutherford, he had two guys working for him. So when you're a professor at uni, you can have some guys under you working for you. Maybe two of your students who finished their course and have stayed on to do some experiments. And he had Marsden and um, Geiger, I think. And they found out... Um, you don't need to know a lot about them. You just need to know that the plum pudding model, and trust me, in all the years teaching this A-level course, they haven't really asked about Geiger and Marsden, but they occasionally they ask questions about these things we've just covered, which are really, really super basic um, for A-level. Um, occasionally they ask questions about this stuff, as I'll show you. I've got a question coming up on it. Um, and of course, what this did, firing alpha particles, they expected them all to go through. And of course, most did go through. However, some bounced straight back. The ones that bounced back gave us evidence of a nucleus. So Rutherford came up with 
discovered the nucleus, a positive, dense nucleus. And the fact that um, most of them went through, he decided that electrons, uh, he proposed that electrons surround this positive nucleus, a cloud of electrons, he described it. Now, this was then proved wrong. So um, this was proved wrong by um, some scientists that did loads of maths equations. Actually, I've said which scientists, but it was a whole bunch of different scientists. But um, a certain scientist said the electrons can't hang out in clouds. They'll get pulled into the nucleus if they're hanging out in these clouds. Uh, they'll spiral towards the protons, as you can see with my funky green electrons whizzing down towards the protons. So um, because, of course, negative and positive attract. And this was, I think he was Danish. I don't even know if I'm going to spell his name right, which is disgusting, really, isn't it? Um, Niles Bohr. I think he's got an element named after him. I reckon Boron's named after him in group three. OK, so Niles Bohr uh, or Niels Bohr, Niles Bohr, however you say his name, um, he proposed that the electrons were in levels that you did at GCSE, like two in the first ring, eight in the next ring, eight in the next. Now, at A level, this has been refined even more, but it's still not correct. OK, so each level is not correct. So... What I'm saying is what you learn at GCSC, we still use this at A-level and you may be asked to draw this at A-level. You may be asked to draw the electronic configuration of an, at of an atom like this, okay? But this is a much simpler model, which helps. But once you go past like the first 20 elements, the model breaks down because it's not how electrons, uh, well, the model that you're learning at A-level shows the electrons behaving in a different way. So, um, the Bohr model has been refined, which means developed further to show that electrons exist in subshells. So, you know, these rings that we call shells. Well, at A level, what we say is that not all the electrons in the same ring have the same energy. So these four are all in the second shell. But we break that down now into subshells. And then we break those subshells down further into things called orbitals. And I'm covering that next lesson about w the electronic configurations. That comes in next lesson, uh, which I'm going to do next week and show you that we no longer use this method. We have to write the electrons out in a totally different way. Um, there are even more advanced models than this, but this is the one that's really useful. It helps us explain things that you're going to learn called ionization energies. And it helps explain bonding really well and the properties of the transition metals and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, got some definitions you have to know at A level. Let me just see if I can make these bigger because I don't know if you can see them. Any questions so far? This is now getting into new content. You've kind of learned all the other stuff before. So we're now on to new content for you guys. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so these are three definitions. There's about 20 or 30, maybe 30 is an exaggeration. So, you know, like at GCSE, although you got an equation sheet uh, in previous years, they've had to memorize the equations. In chemistry A level, you have to memorize definitions, and there's quite a few definitions. So here are three definitions in the first lesson that you have to memorize, okay? And it's the RAM, which you did at GCSE, relative atomic mass. And this at GCSE, we just say it's the average mass of the isotopes of an element. At A level, we have to say it's the average mass of an atom of an element on a scale where carbon 12 is 12. Now, you might say to me, what the bloody hell does that mean? Well, let's look at the next one, the relative isotopic mass. This is the mass of an atom of an isotope like nitrogen 14, 15 or 16 on a, on a relative to carbon 12 on a scale where carbon is 12. What does that mean? Well, atoms, we can't weigh them. They're so light. If you think one mole of hydrogen atoms is one gram 
and there were 6.022 times 10 to the 23 hydrogen atoms in one gram. There's no machine being invented by humans. There's no technology being invented that can measure the mass of an atom. There's no scale that can do that. So what we do is we get assigned a number to carbon. Uh, so we picked carbon and we gave it the number 12 and said, the, the, med, the mass of carbon is 12, and it just so happens that one mole of carbon is 12 grams. But we said the mass of carbon is 12, so for instance, hydrogen we give a 1 to because it's 12 times lighter than carbon. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how it works. Magnesium has a mass number of 24, so we're basically saying it's twice as heavy as carbon when compared to carbon, where we say that carbon is 12. Because magnesium is twice as heavy, we'll give it the number 24 to show it's twice carbon. So anyway, very difficult to understand, I know, but the relative atomic mass is the average mass of an atom of an element on a scale where an atom of carbon 12 is 12. The relative isotopic mass is the mass of an atom of an isotope you could just say the mass of an isotope of an element on a scale where an atom of carbon 12 is 12. And the relative molecular mass is the average mass of a molecule on a scale where an atom of carbon 12 is given the unit 12. So that might be a bit freaky, but there's some weird definitions you have to remember. So some questions here. Why can't we weigh individual atoms? They're tiny, 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 as I already explained. So small. Remember, in one mole of carbon, 12 grams of carbon, that's a couple of teaspoons of carbon, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So impossible to weigh. We don't use M. We use MR for molecules. So you might remember molecules are things like carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, can anyone tell me the MR of carbon dioxide, by the way? Anyone off by, or anybody remember the mass number for oxygen and carbon? What's the MR of carbon dioxide? You might remember from your mole calculations. Yay, well done, uh, Lois, that's 44. Oh, my neck is so cracked up. Nice one. Brilliant. Now. If I said to you, what's the MR of sodium chloride, which I've just written down there, what would that be? Who can tell me the MR of sodium chloride? Sodium's 23, chlorine is 35.5. So together, it's going to equal 58.5. Now, um, yeah, nice one, Lois. Now, we can't really call it MR. It's a bit of a technical thing, but sodium chloride doesn't exist as a molecule. It doesn't exist as a molecule. It comes as a giant structure. Remember those giant structures? Um, so sodium chloride is, this is the worst drawing of a giant, worst drawing of a giant structure so scrap that have i got space up here just about so sodium chloride kind of looks like this this is a terrible drawing of a giant lattice but it's a giant structure so they're not going to exist ever on its own like that so we call it the relative formula mass it's just a technicality it's the same thing as mr we're basically saying it's one unit that would have trillions of atoms in it. We're basically saying if you take a single unit, a formu the formula, the relative formula of sodium chloride is NaCl. So we're saying that is 58.5. Okay, It's not a molecule because it appears in a giant structure. Cool. Anyway, just a technicality. That's RFM. Right. Another bit of uh, A-level. Okay, this is an old picture. This lady here is operating a machine called a mass spectrometer. And when you have an unknown substance, we can identify that substance by um, working out its AR, its atomic mass, or its MR if it's a molecule, and then working out from the period, using the periodic table, we can work out what the element actually is, if it's an unknown element. So if we found something 
in your blood or in a sample of urine or just some a chemical on a desk somewhere we wanted to find out what it is we'd use mass spectrometry in all of those um, programs when people are smuggling drugs in the airport and they find the drugs or the powder and they what they test it with is a mass spectrometer so they do some chemical analysis now the one you have to know for AQA chemistry is called time of flight mass spectrometry and sometimes it is just known as T O F like that time of flight spectrometry now what we're going to look at it happens in four steps okay and you have to know this so this is bit of A-level uh, content here that gets quite difficult with some of the questions, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. So um, literally today, it's not going to be more than an hour of the lesson because um, there's not that much to do after time of flight. We're nearly there. So ionization, the, but there's some exam questions which are pretty tough. So we'll go through those. Um, ionization, acceleration, ion drift, and detection. Now, there are many different ways to do mass spectrometry, and most of them involve turning the sample into an ion by ionization. But in the old syllabus of AQA, if you're doing past papers, you might come across ones that use magnetic fields to deflect particles. We don't use that in time of flight. So the new way of us doing it in the AQA syllabus is by TOF, time of flight mass spectrometry. I'll stop waffling and I'll explain what it's about. So ionization, first of all, we take a sample. You see I've drawn a, a blue particle a black particle and a red particle in there they're my unknown substance we then there's two ways to ionize them you can either inject them at high pressure into a vacuum chamber and this number one would be the vacuum chamber where ionization takes place this will force them into a gas gaseous state we want them as a gas later on so they can drift in stage three and then we need to turn them into ions and we need them to be positive ions and I'll explain why. Um, so we're going to make them into positive ions. And there's two ways you can do that. So one way is using this needle thing that I've done there. So they're all going to be turned into positive ions. I don't know why they all got bigger. That They were supposed to be different sizes. But they've been injected here. So that's one way you can inject them. And as you inject them, a voltage passes across the end of the needle here and I've got the notes on this which I'll put up but you can always watch it back and make notes so one way to turn them into an iron is to inject them with a high pressure needle into the vacuum pass a voltage across the end of the needle and using a solvent in the sam mixed with the sample, hydrogen ions, it's getting complicated, are added to the particles, making them positive. Remember the H plus ion. So that would make them positive. That's one way to do it. And I've got the notes on the next slide. So don't worry if you're thinking, geez, that was a lot. Or there's this way down here. We can use an electron gun. And this is known as electron bombardment it's not a real gun it's a thin piece of filament metal wire like you used to find in old light bulbs gets very hot and creates a stream of excited electrons that come out bump into the atoms and turn them into ions okay they knock electrons off and they become ions either way using electron bombardment with the electron gun or using electron electro spray ionization, which is using the needle, the voltage, and the solvent, where you add hydrogen ions. Either way, you end up with a positive particle. That's the main thing, and that's called ionization, turning it into a positive particle. Finally, got that out. The second stage is acceleration. Now we have an electric field. Okay, lots of pluses and minuses going on. There's basically an electric field going on in here. Zzz, right, you get the idea. The ions are going to get accelerated through the electric field. Okay, um, they're attracted to the negative end of the electric field and they become accelerated. This is the crustiest drawing in the history of time of flight drawings. But there we go. Now, the smaller the particle, my red one is supposed to be smaller. The smaller the particle, the more it will be accelerated. 
okay we actually say the lower it's mz mass charge ratio what do we mean by mass charge well they've all got the same charge but um so we've got this symbol mz we're going to come across this in a little bit and this is known as the mass charge ratio now normally when you do mass spectrometry the charge is the same. You're turning them all into plus one ions. So you're dividing the mass by the charge. So you're dividing the mass by one. So it's really just the mass of that particle. Um, and it's known as the mass charge ratio. Now in chemistry, you can just write MZ. Okay. Um, and they're accelerated. And they all gain the same kinetic energy so we've got a little bit of physics coming in here uh, however smaller ones or ones with a lower mz a lower mass or a lower mz lower mass charge ratio smaller ones will move faster they will have higher speeds they've all got the same kinetic energy but if you've got a smaller mass and you have the same kinetic energy your velocity must be bigger so we do acceleration, and if you remember, I think my photo's in the way. Let me just move this. No, oh, Sugar Ray Leonard. Where is my... Um... Okay, let's move that right out of the way. Up in the corner there. Okay, so does anyone remember the equation? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's Lois. That's right. They're all only plus one ions. There could be a real trick question where they say one is a plus two ion and then it's going to screw up the mass. You're going to have to divide the mass by two and that's going to change stuff later on. But that would be unusual, which they are likely to throw at you in certain difficult higher level questions. So something to like catch you off your guard. You know how they did in the GCSEs. They throw something in a totally different way. So they're normally always plus one ions. Right. Can anybody remember the kinetic energy equation from physics? You guys didn't have to memorize it, but it, what was it? Ke equals, there's a bunch of ways to write it, but um, half mv squared is one way to write it. You could rearrange that and write it in a different way. So they all gain the same kinetic energy. Thank you, Gabby. Yep, they all gain the same kinetic energy, but the um, their velocities will be different because they have different masses. So they're all accelerated to the same Ke, but they have different velocities. Now we enter the ion drift chamber. The ion drift chamber has no electric field, has no plus or minus, so they just start to drift. But they have drift at different speeds across this chamber, and we can do some equations, which you're going to get in a second. I'm going to give you uh, using the old speed equals distance divided by time. You could be asked to work out how long the tube is. Here's the old um, tube here, up here that this lady's sitting underneath in this black and white photo, doing a bit of mass spec. There's the tube. So um, you could be asked, how long do they drift along the tubes? You could be asked to find out time. You could be asked to find out distance, i.e. the length of the tube. And you can imagine they'll get you to use the kinetic energy to work out the velocity and you'll do some of those physics equations. But they're quite tricky. We're going to have a go at one in a second. The final part of time of flight spectrometry is called detection. And what happens with detection is um, basically this is a negative plate full of electrons. And as the ions touch it, they kind of become discharged. So um, Yikes. What happened there? Okay, I'm back. And what happens is a small bit of current as they go, leaves the detector plate and goes into the positive ions. The size of that current tells us the abundance. So if there's loads of those red ones, or if they're all going to arrive at the same time, because they're traveling at the same speed, and we're going to get electron flow, a small current from the detector plate into the ions. Now, the amount of that current tells us the abundance. Do you remember those RAM questions where they said you have calcium uh, 40 or whatever, 
and calcium 41 and calcium 42 and one's 20 percent abundance one's 35 percent abundance etc and one's 45 percent abundance how do they know the abundance of the different ones because they have a different mass number they arrive at the plate at different times and the amount of them that there are in the sample will cause a bigger current if there's more of them in the sample you'll get a bigger current so they then plot this on a graph anyway you can go through this later and look at this. These are the notes of what I've just verbally explained. So you've got ionization, electro spray ionization. We dissolve the sample and it's injected at a high pressure into the vacuum. Whilst a high voltage is applied, this protonates the sample, protonates. It adds a hydrogen, basically a proton. Hydrogen, um, Remember, hydrogen doesn't have a new, uh, well, a hydrogen ion is essentially just a proton. It doesn't have a neutron. It's got a mass number of one and a proton number of one. It's essentially just a proton. So the hydrogen, once it's lost its electron, it's just a, a basically a proton. So we can protonate them by adding that proton to that. And then it has a, it forms, that has the formula XH plus, or we can use the electron bombardment method to create a positive plus one ion where we fire a beam of electrons, as I said, from the hot filament. And so I've got sample Y or atom Y, and it's becoming, um, yeah, it's becoming Y plus, and an electron's been knocked off. Right, then we accelerate it. As I said, there's an electron field. Ions with the lowest mass or lowest mass charge ratio accelerate more. Then they drift through the drift chamber, uh, which um, there's no electric field in there. They've left the electric field. They have a constant kinetic energy and they all have a constant speed. They have a different speed, but it's all constant for each type of atom, each mass. And then at detection, ones with a lower MZ, which means a lower mass, reach the detector in less time. As they touch the charge plate, electrons or a current flows into the ion and that's then read by the computer and that gives us the abundance so you just have to know how they get to this situation so you might remember these from GCSE you have like chlorine 35 so let's have a look we're going to do some questions in a sec so chlorine 35 There'd be a line going up here. Oh gosh, what the hedge is that? Right, up to about 75.5. And so that is supposed to be 75.5%. And we'd also have a line going up on 37, and that is to 24.5. And this is the kind of spectrum we would get. And we would then know, oh, this is chlorine. Um, so how would I calculate? Can anybody calculate the mass of chlorine? Using the old system, you might remember how to calculate the mass of chlorine. The RAM of chlorine. How would I calculate it? Anybody know what we would do next to calculate the mass of chlorine? So we'd now multiply the abundance Thanks, Lois. We'd multiply the abundance by the mass. I should really put these in brackets. If you've got a calculator, you might be able to work that out for me. Uh, times 37. Remember, you times the abundance by each. So why did we use time of flight? Well, time of flight is what gave us these abundances. So you see these percentage, ah, what the hell have I done there? See these percentage abundances, that time of flight gave us that. And then divide by 100, thank you. 
awesome. Now, I've got the old calculator. Let me quickly whip that in so I don't mess it up. 75.5 times 35 plus... Uh, and then add that to 24.5 times 37 equals that. Divide by 100. Oh, I don't know. My calculator is giving me 35.4 something. But yeah, we're in the right ballpark. So whatever that is. Anyway, um, you did mention about the mass charge. That was a really good question. You said, see here, the mass charge ratio means you divide the mass of the element by the isotope's charge. After the time of flight, the ions are normally plus one. So MZ is really just dividing the mass. Like, So normally you just go, oh, well, the atom that's 35, the chlorine that has a 35 mass, you just divide it by one and you get 35. So really, the MZ is normally, this is MZ, and it's normally equal to the mass. So we kind of normally, they're interchangeable. Watch out, the little sly gits could do something one day where they say element X has a 2 plus charge, and then it would be 17.5. You'd do 35 divided by 2 if they said, what's the MZ? So the mass charge ratio, normally it's divided by one. So it's exactly the same as the mass, but there could be a sly little one that they can do sometimes. So watch out for that. Now, um, how would we calculate the relative atomic mass for magnesium? Um, uh, clicked on the wrong button. Just waiting for it to load. Right, let's go back to where we were, because actually, you brought up a good question about group seven, Lois. So you brought up a good question about group seven. We would actually get, I'll come back to that. Just remind me to come back to group seven, actually, in the mass spectrum of group seven. Um, We'd actually get also at group seven. Let me um, delete this here. Oh, I think we've lost a couple of people. Never mind. Um, yikes. Okay. We'd actually also get Lois. If we put chlorine molecules through the mass spectrometer, the time of flight mass spectrometer, we wouldn't just get a reading at 35 and 37. We'd also get a reading at 70, 72, and 74. Why would we get readings, lines, at 70, 72, and 74? Any ideas? Yeah, that's right, Lois. Uh, so basically, CL35, with the electron bombardment, an electron's going to hit that, knock uh, knock off an electron and leave it as CL35+. plus. We're then going to have, we got CL37, and this is a plus ion too. But also, we could have a diatomic one where it's, you know, 35 and 35 diatomic one where it's 35 and 37 and they've made it to the plate so you do have to watch out they they sometimes have odd things like that and then of course we could have 37 and 37 which makes 74 so we'd actually get a cluster of readings for chlorine if you put into google mass spec the word mass spectrum means the the pattern like the fingerprint of the element that is so if i was looking in a sample, and I got that reading on the printout from the computer, I'd go, that's chlorine, because I'd get five distinct bars. I'd get one at 35, one at 37, and then these three at 70, 72, and 74. There might be some other little bars as well, but um, yeah, that would be the main fingerprint for the element. So um, yeah, as I say here, uh, mass spectrums are used as fingerprints to identify different elements. Um, 
I won't get you to do this one for magnesium, but if we if we do that, you'll find that unlike GCSC, magnesium is um, not 24 exactly. In fact, most of the elements aren't 24. Let's just have a quick look. Because of the fact that they exist as isotopes, look at this periodic table. Um, let me just see if this is switched over. Yeah, you're with me. Great. I uh, just wanted to see if the periodic table had appeared on the screen. Check out the mass numbers now. This is the AQA A-level periodic table. It's the same for OCR pretty much. So um, you can see here potassium's 39.1, magnesium's 24.3, iron is 55.8. Um, you've got all these different numbers. So rubidium is 85.5, nickel is 58.7. So lithium is no longer 7 at A-level. It's 6.9. So um, they get a bit extreme. Um, when you say, would you have to divide each by two? No, not for the MZ ratio. Hi, Gabby. Yeah, the mass charge ratio. Good questions. The, the, these are good questions. So the mass charge ratio, like when I form, when I bombard something. So let's say I've bomb. See, it says MZ down here. When the electrons bombarded this, these magnesium atoms here, Mg24, they formed Mg plus, right? But their mass was 24. Ah! And the charge is plus 1. So if I divide 24 by 1, essentially, I get 24. So That's what the mass charge ratio is. It's just the mass of the atom or ion as it is. They're ions. So it's the mass of the ion divided by its the number of its positive charge. Normally in mass spectrometry, it should be plus one. Obviously, there might be situations where they try and trick you and they say, in this electron bombardment, the magnesium formed a plus two ion. What would be its MZ ratio? or draw a bar where its MZ ratio would be, and that would be over here. If if magnesium formed a plus two ion, we would get a little bar there at 12. We'd be like, but hold on, magnesium doesn't have a mass of 12, but it's its mass charge ratio, so it would be 24 divided by 2. So um, don't worry about being lost. It's chemistry. It's A-level, so it's cool. Um, Lois, magnesium is in group two, but let me clear that up, Lois. When the electrons hit an atom and they become an ion, they don't have to, they don't lose, they only lose one electron, okay? So I could be smashing into a chlorine and it will become chlorine plus. Now, chlorine, we know, is in group seven. It normally becomes minus. But if I knock an electron off, we're no longer, when we're doing mass spectrometry, we're no longer thinking about oxidation and reduction and them losing or gaining electrons. We're just knocking an electron off, off of any atom, regardless if they're metal, non-metal, or what group they're in. So it's not to do with their group number. Okay, so we're literally either adding a proton or we're knocking an electron off. So they're always plus one, yes, unless I'm saying there's a weird ass question uh, which you could get where they say the charge is different. It will normally always be plus one. And I should really just teach you the normal circumstances and not the exceptions. The exceptions are really when you're doing revision towards exams and stuff. Otherwise it gets even more confusing. It's like, um, yeah, cool. Yes, they only ever lose one electron. That's right, Gabby. Now, there could be a situation where they tell you, oh, this atom lost three electrons. And um, that would be unusual. So you would divide the mass by three to make a bar. So um, now the height of the bar is the relative abundance. So this magnesium 24, 
79% and they would hit. It's got the lowest MZ. That means it's the lightest. They hit the detector first. And that electric current, because there was most of the sample was magnesium 24, there was a bigger spike in electric current when they hit. And that's printed out on the paper. Then the, along came magnesium 25 in second place because it's the next lightest. Remember, they've all got the same kinetic energy, but different velocities uh, because of their masses, slightly different velocities. So magnesium 24, 25 hits like 0.1 seconds later, but there's only 10%, one eighth the amount. So its bar is only one, only one eighth the current was was created at the plate then and then it makes a line for that and then along came magnesium 26 so this is how they work out the abundance pretty complex but let's look at let's get you even more confused so just to get you even more confused mass spectrometry can be used to identify molecules as well now in the second year of a level it gets even more complicated it gets very complicated but they just hint at looking at molecules in the first year. So mass spectrometry can be used to identify molecules. What we have here is carbon dioxide, okay? Um, and earlier I said, what's the MR of carbon dioxide? You guys said 44, so spot on. Um, what do you think 44 represents? Well, 44, ooh, let's get off of the highlighter pen. Forty four is CO two plus. So you can knock an electron off of a molecule as well and make an ion out of it. Okay. And the tallest peak, if you've if your sample is a molecule, then the tallest peak represents the mass of the molecule, the actual MR straight off. So you don't like we know straight away, ah, the tallest peak there is 44. It's the highest peak. And we know that. So I would now identify this as carbon dioxide. I could identify this as carbon dioxide. And we call this, this is known as the M plus ion. Means the molecular ion. M plus ion means the ion of the molecule. But what are these other peaks? Well, imagine if my electrons hit it, this is, a, a, you get something called fragmentation. Um, the molecule can break. What do you think 12 represents? This little bar here, what does this little bar here with the 12 above it represent? What could have broken off of carbon dioxide when it got bombarded with electrons? That's right. That's actually a carbon ion where it snapped and a carbon atom came off. Now, this is a bit advanced, this stuff. What about 16? What could 16 be? What in there has a mass of 16? Can you think of anything in there? Not an isotope of carbon. There is carbon 12 and 13 and 14. What else in carbon dioxide? Is there something else that can have a mass of 16? Oxygen. Yep. So that's an oxygen. Now it's getting tricky. What do you think? Can you make up a molecule with C and O's that equals 28? By the way, be prepared at A-level. You're going to get confused a lot and it will take time for things to sink in. You get, um, yeah. Yeah, that's carbon monoxide. So you get all these peaks, but the identity of the molecule is always given by the largest. When it's a molecule, and they'll tell you in the question that you're dealing with a molecule, and this is the mass spectrum from an unknown molecule. Then you look at the largest one and you say 44 and you can piece it together as carbon dioxide. Now, with a bit more information, you could like you could go, oh, that's carbon, that's oxygen. Oh, I think this is carbon dioxide. 
So you could like piece it together. You wouldn't be asked to do that in the first year. That's more in the second year, piecing it all together. You'd be given other information as well from other tests. But um, we call that the molecular ion. In fact, sometimes we even do get a tiny, tiny peak here at 45 and maybe 46. And they would be, you, that wouldn't be the M plus ion. So normally it's the one with the biggest mass. But this is one, um, we sometimes get a tiny peak at 45 or 46 where there is an isotope like carbon-13 or carbon-14 involved. Anyway, let's not worry about that now. Um, oh, extra, yeah, um, he says. So any questions? Obviously, that was very confusing. Why is there no peak at 32 for two oxygens? Why do you think there's no peak at 32? Let's look at how carbon dioxide is bonded. So when those electrons crack into it and knock uh, an electron off, they sometimes break bonds, those bombardments of electrons. But obviously, there's no way that they can break this and it can be a C and an O. They can break an O off. Uh, they could break both O's off and leave a C, but they can't really break it where there's two O's because the O's were never stuck together anyway. They were never bonded together. So, yeah, and that's good as well. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Right. Ah, the other one, Gabby, was for elements mainly, although I started to drift into molecules once I was talking about chlorine. But we'll have a look. Let's have a look at some. Let's go through some examples. Sometimes it's easier to teach with the questions, isn't it? So uh, let's have a go at some of these with the questions. So see if you can do this one. So, um, oh, that looks hard. Uh, I hope you're good at maths. State two features. Uh, OK, so the question is about atomic structure. This is a six mark question on atomic structure. So on this chapter or this unit, the figure below is a model proposed by Rutherford to show the structure of an atom. State two features of the current model that are not shown in the Rutherford model. So here is the Rutherford model. After he did the plum pudding, he said, yes, positive nucleus with negative electrons around them. What hasn't he shown? Yeah, he's not showing the neutrons. What mistakes he made with the electrons as well. Yeah, the shells. He hasn't shown electrons in different shells. Totally. Right. Over here is a slightly tricky maths question to test you out. A sample is analyzed, uh, a sample is analyzed, a sample of tin, sorry, an element, metal element, is analyzed in a time of flight mass spectrometer. The sample is ionized by electron impact or electron bombardment to form plus one ions. The table below shows the data about the four peaks. So we've got the MZ, that's the mass number essentially. So we've got the MZ of each. And the percentage abundance. Give the symbol, including the mass number of the ion that reaches the detector first. All right. So which of these would reach the detector first? Uh, calculate the relative atomic mass of tin in this sample. Give your answer to one decimal place. Right. Let me make that bigger. Thank you. I shall make it bigger. No, that's good. That's good. We need that. Um, hey, what if I go back, back? Well, can I get rid of my stupid yellow? Yes. Right, let's zing this one away. That was nice and easy. Just to show you that that stuff we did at the start can come up. Hold on. Got my answers down there.
All right, guys. Can you see this now? Can you read this one? Just checking you can read it. Yay. Right, guys. Calculate the RAM if you can. But there's a whole bunch of stuff here, but you can definitely give the symbol. Don't worry about the symbol for the moment, including the mass number of the ion that reaches the detector first. But calculate the RAM of the tin in this sample. So to be determined, or well, you can work that out, right? Percentage abundance. How will you work out the missing percentage for that? <laughs> yeah, RAM, yeah. Relative atomic mass. <laughs> so how do you work out the RAM? Just pretend it's one of your GCSE ones. What would you do here, guys? So they're just trying to confuse you by using MZ. In the old days, we'd have put the name of the elements there at GCSE. All you've got to do here is times the mass by the percentage abundance. So just the MZ by the percentage abundance. What do you think to be determined must be? You can work out what that is. So you. Um, if you're re-watching this on a rewatch, you can always pause because I'm going to go through how to do it now So and have a go at it and then see if you get it right. Um, but essentially, you just got to do that, guys. Um, my typing skills are so slow. This could take four years. Oh, it's going to be long. Um, we're getting there. Eventually, someone's going to work it out. This is a four marker. This will be seen as a um, tricky one. You'll probably be able to work it out by the time I've um, typed this. Jeez. Now, we know this one's 120. What must the percentage be? <laughs> okay, Lois, but what was the percentage? They should all, what should they all add up to? The percentages. So, Gabby, what should all those percentages add up to? Yeah, yeah. So, what's the missing one? Hopefully, hopefully they all add up to that. Otherwise, I will be bamboozled too. Um, Take away 34.97. So 30.84, was it? The missing percentage to be determined. Yeah, nice. And then did you divide them all by 100? Remember, for the RAM from your old GCSE, you got to divide by 100. No, it can't do. That's got to be a mistake there. I might have print. Um... No, you're working out. <laughs> I think what your ca my calculator does that. I need to smash this one up and get another one because if I don't put the brackets, it starts timesing them all in the wrong way. So can anyone work that out? I'm relying on you guys because I'm so slow. Okay, I'm on it. But by the time I've done it, it's like watching an old person turning with you ever seen your grand or your granddad with the TV controller trying to change the channel. That's what it's like me on the calculator. It's like, uh I've probably put the wrong number in as well. Honestly, sometimes I despair. 30.84, 116.45. That's looking good.
Oh no, you. Yeah, the final one is thirty point eight four times one hundred and twenty because it's giving you that info. Yeah. So you do all of that, and then you divide by a hundred, and you get. One one six. Let's hope it's right. Point four five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, good spot, good spot. Give your answer to one decimal place. Whee. Yeah, you got to watch out for this. And did I highlight that? Did I not? No. So give your answer to one D. And I definitely recommend the old highlighter. Don't worry, that's not all the marks. That'll probably only get you two. The other two, saying now, let's go to the periodic table. Can we identify this element? Boom. 116. Which element's got a mass of 116? Oh, my gosh. Oh, they told us it was tin, right? Oh, they told us it was tin. We don't need to identify it. Yeah, they said it was tin. So, the... The symbol for tin is S N. Okay. So for the other two marks, they said give the symbol S N, including the mass number of the ion. What so what do I need to write? What will be the symbol of a tin ion in this situation? It's been through time of flight. So what should its symbol be? Plus, yeah, well done, Karen. Yeah, so SN plus, they want the mass number. Where am I going to write it? I, I might write it over here. Probably going to be, they want it on the right. But you need the mass number. Maybe I could do it like this, and they'll accept this. 116.5. Let's have a look. That would get us all the marks. Oh, actually, sorry. What have I screwed up? It's nice if you read the question, if your stupid teacher doesn't. So, um, yes, give the symbol, including the mass number, of the one that reaches there first. So, actually, it has to be one of these. The mass is one of these. Which one will be the first to hit the detector? Which one of those will be the first to reach the detector in time of flight? Do you remember I talked about they all get the same kinetic energy, but they have different velocities. So if you think that kinetic energy is half mass velocity squared, but they've all got the same kinetic energy. So if all of these have got the same Ke, which one has the biggest velocity? I don't think it'll be 114. Remember, the MZ is basically the mass. They told us they're plus one, so it's the mass divided by plus one, the mass over one. So, ah, no, not, that will give the biggest current and the biggest spike on the graph. But remember the formula here, Ke equals M half, oh gosh, mashing this up, V squared. So it's the one with the small, in order to have the same kinetic energy, the one with the smallest mass must have the highest velocity. So it's actually 112. Okay. It has to have the highest velocity because it's got the lowest mass. And mass times velocity is equal to Ke, right? Those there are the mass numbers. Think of mz normally as just the mass number. It is the mass charge ratio. But as it's normally plus one, it's the mass over plus one. So it's normally equal to the mass number. The percentage abundance is how many of them there are. They all hit the detector at the same time. And the one that gives the biggest spike would be 117 because there's 34.97%. You're right, 117 is the biggest abundance. That would give the biggest electric spike in current. 
yeah, you really want to look at mass for that one. So let's have a little look at the old answer Rooney's. He says, but yeah, yeah. So the four marks, let me get rid of my face. Ah. Go down there for a sec. No. So uh, 112 SN plus for one mark. The abundance was 30.84%. The missing abundance. So we get a mark for that. Um, yeah, RAM 116.5. Well done with the 1DP. And then, yeah, that was it. And one for the working out. Great. Okay, one more of these, then I'm just going to give you a horrible time of flight, then we're going to sign off. But um, the mass spectrum of the isotopes of element X is shown in the diagram. Define the term relative atomic mass. Don't worry about that one. That one you've got to learn off by heart. It's one of those horrible ones. Um, don't worry about that one. It's a two marker, but leave that. It's on the mark scheme. I'll put it up in a sec. Use data from the diagram to calculate the relative atomic mass of X. Okay, who's first to work out the relative atomic mass of X? So, this time, uh, it's not very tricky, but the abundances aren't in percentages. So, don't worry if they're not in a percentage. Can you work out the relative atomic mass of X? You've got to use these four black bars, which show the MZ, which is the same as the mass. And you've got the abundance on the left-hand side. So you've got to read it off. Do the little timesy timesy. Divide by the total abundance. Come up with the answer. 8.21. Remember, you've got to times abundance by... Your answer is always going to be in the range... Your answer should be in the range of these guys, right? Hold on, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If the mass is seven, if you've got four isotopes, 70, 72, 73, and 74, the average of those four isotopes is going to be in the 70s, right? In fact, which one is it going to be closest to? It's going to be closest to 74. So... we should be getting a number closest to 74. You've got a whole bunch of isotopes. What's the average mass of those isotopes? If we want to give the definition, we can say relative to carbon 12 on a scale where carbon 12 is 12. But yeah, um, that that's the definition. But Yes, Karam, 72.4 sounds okay. Did you do, did you times by the abundance? So this is just doing one of your isotopic ones. So you're just going to do this, guys. 70 times 3. Yes, but you got to do, ah, oh, maybe. You guys might be right and I might be wrong. There is always a high possibility of this. But did you do 72 times 4? And then did you add that to 73? Remember, you've got to times the abundance. It's just the same as GCSE. It just looks a bit different. And then I haven't put mine in brackets, excuse me. And then times 5, like that. And then did you divide by 13? No, 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 no. Okay. You might be right. Ah, look at the the relative abundance normally is in percentage, but this time it's not. So you always, rather than always dividing by 100, 
you should be dividing by the total abundance. So occasionally, the abundance doesn't add up to 100. And if you do it that way, what do we get? And do they say to one decimal place? Seventy two point three eight, so seventy two point four. Well done. Now it asks you, cool, cool, cool. Now it asks you here, well done, guys, well done. These are all A level questions. So what you're seeing is that that it's a level up from GCSE, but identify the ion responsible for peak 72. This is where we're going to flick to the periodic table. Yes, well done, Karam. Um, where is 72? Who's got, who can find number 72 on here? So which element has a mass of 72? <laughs> I probably got my face over it, so you probably can't see it. Should probably move my face back to the top. Anyone spot an element with a a hey, Karam's on fire? Germanium. It is indeed Germanium. How come Germany get a uh, element named after them? Not fair. Right, so symbol J E. What mustn't I forget? It's only one mark. What do I need to write as well? It says ion. I need to give it a plus and i need to write the mass 72 where am i going to write 72 i'm going to write it over here because it all gets a bit too confusing there we go yep and you've got to write the mass number on these as well so cool leo right now we're going on to a super hard question so um it's tricky 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 these are all the definitions that go there don't worry about those uh, they're all the definitions of relative atomic mass. There's only one that I like, and it's the one I used at the start, so you can look back at that. Um, okay, can skip this. Just notice just before the live, this is from the old spec. In the old spec, they said, identify which one of these isotopes is deflected the most by the magnetic field of a mass spectrometer. So it meant out of those germaniums, which germaniums, which one, 70, 72, 73, or 74, would be deflected the most by uh, the magnetic field? We don't use a magnetic field in time of flight. We use an electric field. So that's one of the differences in the old specification. The old way of doing mass spectrometry used a magnetic field um, to deflect the particles basically, to cause them to bend. Uh, we don't use that now in time of flight, so we can skip that bit. What I'm interested in here... Um, yeah, this is just a question. I'm just going to quickly zing through that. This just says, each of these peaks over here are generated when the ion hits the plate. Explain how the current is generated. This one just wants you to say when the ions hit the detector plate in stage four of the time of flight mass spectrometry or spectrometry, the um, negative electrons in the detective plate or detector plate move into the ion. So, and you get a greater current, the greater the abundance of that ion. So, yeah. Current doesn't go from the ion, it's positive. It goes from the detector plate towards the ion. Right, um, they're the answers for all of the stuff. Um, yeah, let me zing on. Oh, you'll be getting some multiple choice questions, guys. 
in chemistry A level, you'll get multiple choice. Um, but they're not always easy. Check out these three. So, for the first one, which of these atoms has the smallest number of neutrons? A little bit tricky. Oh my days. Karam's on fire at the moment. Yeah, you're a bit on fire at the moment. Gonna have to give you a little shout out. <laughs> Some stupid little things. I've got loads of little stupid videos to play, but not at the moment. I'm waiting. Uh, <laughs> right, for the next, well done, by the way. Yeah, because if you look at hydrogen, hydrogen with a mass number of three has an atomic number of one, so it has two neutrons. If you look at helium, helium with a mass number of four, but with an atomic number of two, has two neutrons as well. And if we look at helium here with an isotope, helium normally has a mass of four, doesn't it? But helium here has a mass of five. Uh, so it's got three neutrons whereas if we look at lithium do you remember the atomic number it's normally three so it's only got one neutron yeah so um yeah that's right that's right it's got one neutron so lithium has the smallest number of neutrons all right who can get this one in time of flight mass spectrometer uh, uh, in a time of flight mass spectrometer molecule x is ionized using electrospray ionization what is the equation for this ionization? This is a different one. This is called electrospray ionization. This is when it's dissolved in a solvent, injected into the time of flight, and it gets protonated. Which one do you think shows the ion being protonated? Any ideas, guys? Anyone want to dare a guess? Totally don't worry if you get it wrong. Which one looks like they're adding a proton to it? Ah, uh, good. Um... You're right, it's a liquid to start, but then it's vaporized. So I think you're right, Lois, but I think it's vaporized. So I think you can take that one out of it and go for the one that's in a uh, gaseous state. I think it vaporizes just before it's protonated. So in that case, if they're all gases, which one would you go for? Because then you're looking at D or B. What do you reckon, D or B? <laughs> no problems. Thank you, Eggmaster. Shout out. It's actually, um, it's D, Lois. Yeah, uh, I know what you mean. It's a liquid normally, but when it gets injected in, it's vaporized and then a current is passed across it, causing hydrogen ions to join on and protonate it. Um, it is D. Now, which one of these in the last one, just in case you can't see it, let me try and make it bigger for you guys. Um, so, which statement is correct on what we've done so far? Ah, my mic is hurting my ear. By the way, we'll be done in five, in five minutes. There's one really hard question after this, then we're done. One super hard question I want to leave you with. 
or work through with you. So time of flight spectrometry, current in the detector is proportional to the ion in abundance. Sample particles, do they gain electrons to form positive ions? Particles are detected in order of their kinetic energy. Ions are accelerated by a magnetic field. Lois, that is... I've got to play the special hyper blues music. Well done, Lois. That's absolutely spot on. Yeah, um, it is a, it is a. And now I see that um, I had a, at the bottom one off the screen. But the reason why it's a, um, there's some essential things that are wrong here. Ions aren't accelerated by a magnetic field. Um, it's an electric field in time of flight, not magnetic. So that one's wrong. Um, you don't gain electrons to become positive. And they all have the same kinetic energy, but a different velocity. So it's the current in the detector is proportional uh, to the ion in abundance. Right. Okay. Woo. Let's get ready to rumble. Jeez. Right. Okay, guys. This one is super difficult. Okay. These are the hardest ones you'll get from that first unit on, uh, on time of flight. These are the hardest type of questions using a lot of physics and math skills here. So, um, yeah, 10 points and a million pounds to the winner, 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 winner. Yeah, <laughs> not winner. It's not a competition We're working together here. So let's get into this one. This is the last question for tonight. And then I'm signing off. So uh, a chromium ion 53 is its mass plus because it's been in a time of flight spectrometer flies along the flight tube that has a length of 1.25 meters. The ion has a constant kinetic energy of 1.102 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Ooh, that's not a lot of energy, but it is a tiny ion, very, very small. Here's the equation just arranged in a different way. It's exactly the same as Ke equals half mv squared. We can call it that if we like. However, some things to pay attention to in this five or six, oh, it's a five mark. Sometimes there's six these. Um, the mass of the ion for this equation needs to be converted to kilograms. The speed of the ion is in meters per second as normal, but at A level, notice they don't do m slash s, they do m s to the minus one. So you've got to be online with that. Calculate the time in seconds for the chromium ion to travel down the flight tube to reach the detector. You also need to know Avogadro's constant. Any ideas, guys, of how we can approach this or any of the skills we can do here? These come up quite a bit. There's six markers on this as well. They might ask you to find the distance of the flight tube. In this situation, they've given us the length. They want us to calculate time. What do you know about time? How can you calculate time? Think of it as like your GCSE physics. We can use Avogadro's constant to find the mass. How would we do that, Lois? You're absolutely right. Good, Gabby. So you're putting it all together, guys. We're going to at some point need to do S. Oh, gosh. Get this horrible pen off the board. <laughs> We're going to have to at some point do S equals D over T and rearrange that. Uh, so you need to find the velocity, which we can do from here, but that's not moles, that's mass. So we need to find the mass of one chromium ion so that we can find the speed of one chromium ion. Okay, 
So how are we going to find the mass of a single chromium ion? You're right, though. Nice. Very close, Karam. However, what does chromium has a mass number of 53? So... <laughs> chromium has a mass number of 53, but the question wants it in kilograms. Do you remember what the mass number is always in? That means there's 53 grams in one mole. So we're dealing with one mole. You've got 53 grams in one mole, but it wants the mass in kilograms. So what have we got to do to the 53? If we know that one mole weighs 53 grams, thank you, well done, Lois. So we know that one mole is also equal to 0 0.053 kilograms. Okay, <clears throat> an atom certainly doesn't weigh 53 grams. How many atoms are in one mole of chromium? Well, they, we all know that. It's over here. So how much does one atom weigh? What have we got to do to find the weight of one atom? I'm saying atom. It's an ion, really. But um, what have we got to do to find the weight of one? We know that's 6.022 times 10 to the 23 equals 0 0.053 kilograms. Divide by Avogadro's. Great. So I'm going to divide this. Remember. Avocado or Avogadro's, I always can't say avocado, but Avogadro's constant is the amount of molecules, ions, atoms inside one mole. We know from the mass number of any element, that's how many grams are in a mole. So we've turned grams to kilograms, scoring points here. We're now dividing that and we're going to find out how much does a single chromium ion weigh. Someone tell me how much that weighs. I hope you all know how to use your times 10 because you're going to need that a lot in chemistry. Oh, my gosh. Any answers here, guys? Anyone able to do that on their calc? And this will probably get you two to three marks so far just finding the mass. It's more likely two. That's very stingy in chemistry. 7.8 times 10 to the power of 16. I think it's close, but not quite. Oh, for the full thing. Do you know what? I think you're right. Jeez, Gabby's on some next level. She's like doing some super duper 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 thing. Yeah or whatever yeah boom whatever yeah awesome gabby that's pretty good right let me go through it for everyone then um as gabby has shot ahead 8.8 .8. hey i'm rounding by the way so um my answer might not be exactly the same but there we go so 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 6 now what we're going to do with the mass we need to rearrange <laughs> We don't even know if she's right yet, but we'll see in a sec. Uh, she probably is. Uh, we're going to do two. Hey, we two times KE. we got the mass, so you might remember from GCSE, if I want to find the velocity, that's right, if I want to find the velocity, we need to rearrange this, and if I rearrange it, ba -da -ba -da -bing, velocity is going to be 2ke um, over the mass square rooted, isn't it, yeah, so that's going to be V if you rearrange it, um, yeah. 
So velocity is equal to 2ke over the mass. This is where I make loads of mistakes on my calculator, but um, I just rounded that to 8.8. .8. But now I need to do 1.1. Um, Anyone check Gabby's answer? Has anyone got there yet? 1.102 times 10 to the minus 13. Times that by 2. Lovely jubbly. Um, divide by the mass. 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 26. Get 2.5 times 10 to the 12. Well, let's find out, guys. I got here. I'm here at the velocity. You guys are all ahead of me. Times 10 to the 12. And in your exam, if you... At each step, if you write the answer down, you're going to pick up some marks. So don't be afraid to write bits down at each step in case you mess something up. And then you're going to want to square root that. And that gives me a really big number. 1582575. 0.576. That's the meters per second. So I've got the speed, and I now need to do distance. Um, distance over the speed. Speed and velocity we're just using as the same thing. 7.89 times 10 to the minus 7 is what I got. I know that's probably right, wrong. I, I'm the one who's probably mashed something up. 7.9 times 10 to the minus 7. Yeah. Hey, are we rounding up to 7.9, guys? I think 7.8. You probably will get 7.89 something or other, right? So I think I think you're going to have to round that to 7.9. But you guys would have scored a lot of marks. So that's hard. You can see that that's an A-level mathsy one. 20%, yeah, 20% of the chem is going to be maths so um i should really delete all of this so that um we can see the answer that would be really great if i did that oh, moving that around anyway that's fine i've got the answer there so we don't really need that the answer's all on the board there so you can do follow that i got rid of the exam board's answer because this one's correct so that's the correct answer. All right, guys. Um, well done, guys. Um, I'm going to post the answers to this on Saturday. Um, but I don't know if you're going to be able to read any of these. They're pretty small. Let me see if I can make them bigger. I don't want stupid green stuff all over it. Would help if I didn't do that. The first one is one just like what we've done. is a five marker. So just another practice at that. I'll just put the, I'm going to do a quick five minute vid and upload it on Saturday with the answers just to talk through it. But in case you want to have a go at something, if you're bored in the week, why would you be bored on an awesome summer holiday that you guys have got? So, so you can see here another abundance one. Um, this one here is a graph down the bottom. You've got to put some little lines along there. And then up here, you've got a time of flight five marker like we've just been doing. Five, six marker. I think this one might be six marks. Um, yeah. So that's for homework. All right, guys. It is getting late. So um, nice. Tomorrow, by the way, if any of you are doing or you know anyone who's doing A-level biology, um, yeah, like I say, I'm going to post that on Saturday, but you can always just pause this, scribble it down and have a go at these questions. Can you actually see those questions? Actually, you can't even see the questions. That would help. Jeez, I don't know what's been going on. I must have moved my screen at some point. What a, what an idiot. <laughs> okay.
that might be a bit better. Uh, so, yeah, I'm off to bed, and um, so nice one, guys. Um, I'm doing a biology one tomorrow for those of you. I'm doing lipids, which is quite a short. I say short. This was supposed to be in one hour. I always end up talking too long. Um, yeah, going to do lipids tomorrow for those people that are following along with the OCR and AQA biology course. All right. So. Um, okay, guys, it's late. Time for bed. <laughs> Night. Take care, guys. See you later.